am Dewana Little, and I'm the Executive Director of the YMI Cultural Center, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2020 Asheville City Council Candidates Forum. I'm super excited to hear from all the candidates today. I would like to, um, this forum is the first of its kind. It focuses on specifically racial equity here in Asheville. And I'm super excited to hear from the candidates about this topic. But I um, also would like to touch on some housekeeping rules. So I would like to ask that all attendees keep their cameras and their sound off during this um, forum. We want to make sure that we can hear the candidates clearly as they speak. So if you're not talking, even candidates, and you got background noise, mute yourself. But if you are talking, um, please make sure to unmute so that we can hear you and keep your cameras on. So I would like for all the candidates to cut their cameras on at this time so we can get started. Great, are we ready? Okay, and I'm Danie Eicher, uh, co-moderating with Dewana. I'm so excited to work with you, Dewana, in this fashion. I'm a local organizer, equity and inclusion consultant, and um, the equity director over at Rainbow Community School. I'm also a member of the Keep It Moving Coalition. We're a group of local volunteers who organize the caucuses and affinity groups for those of you in the community who have gone through either Building Bridges and or REI, the Racial Institute Training. Um, the Keep It Moving Coalition is just one of the hosts for tonight's event, along with Building Bridges, the Asheville Racial Equity Collective, and the Asheville Racial Equity Collective organizes the REI workshops in the area. And the other co-host for tonight's event is, of course, the YMI Cultural Center. And that's significant and so, so, so important because the Black Asheville we so often hear about today looks different than the Black Asheville of yesterday. We know that the Black community here um, has been one that had its own richness and power. And for those of you who have seen the uh, promotional flyer for tonight's event, you'll notice that Stevens Lee was the image we used for tonight. The YMI and Stevens Lee are the living remnants of that Black Asheville. Um, and it didn't just melt away, but like the Stevens Lee High School, it was undermined and destroyed due to decisions made by city leaders. And that's why we're having this discussion tonight. Joanna? It's, it's really an awesome opportunity to reflect and I feel like this is the time, now is the time to start reflecting on not just giving the reparations from city and county leaders, but also given the history that is has been destroyed here in Asheville. Stevens Lee is a perfect representative of that mm -hmm. history. Stevens Lee was actually founded in 1923. It is a little bit younger than the YMI that was founded in 1893. But it was founded in 1923, and it was the pride of Black society in Western North Carolina. It was the only secondary educational institution for decades in Western North Carolina. So people were bused for 80 miles round trip to Asheville to attend high school, but it had an academic standard of excellence. Most of the people re fail to realize that most of the teachers and faculty of that school had masters and doctorate degrees mm -hmm. and they produce master and doctorate students like people really came out and excelled. you can look at some of the local le leaders and historians here in Asheville now who graduated from Stevens Lee High School but then desegregation happened and they were black people who were forced into a situation into a system that was never built to include us and it destroyed the black community and the pride that the black community had within that school when a few years later they bulldozed it by the decisions of an all white school. Um, and so all that is standing now, what we see now, what my kids get to experience now is a gymnasium. 
the, the remnants of our history was bulldozed into a gymnasium. And so as we move forward in this forum, the topic of equity is so important, specifically racial equity in reference to the Black community because so much of the Black community was destroyed. But why am I sits in the historically Black business history? And it's predominantly white businesses outside of maybe a few barbershops and hair salons in the line in the church. So it's the reality is what we're dealing with now really shows over history. How can we look at the educational deficit and not consider that we were desegregated and forced into a school system that was never built to include us in the first place? So as we move forward, I'd just like us to think about history and as we frame our answers and talk about this, this so important discussion around racial equity and the state of Black Asheville. So without further ado, do they? Right, we might want to, we do actually want to mention at this point that we've recently gotten a message from Sandra Kilgore that something has come up and she can't join us tonight. And so um, we do want to honor and acknowledge that. So I'm sorry, Dewana, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so with that being in mind, I would like to, um, all of the candidates receive the introduction question. And as you introduce yourselves, we I will frame the introduction question after y'all introduce yourselves. Um, we would like to frame in that question, just for memory, is what is your analysis of racial equity and how inequities are showing up here in Asheville? Just a fresher question. So um, as y'all introduce yourselves, if y'all would like to address the question, you have two minutes to introduce your, yourselves and to um, answer the question. And why don't we start at the top of the screen. My screen here shows Sage Turner up front. Okay, how's the sound? Because I'm calling in. Perfect. Good, all right. So I'm Sage Turner and I appreciate everyone's time in this pivot to a virtual experience tonight. Appreciate all of you coming together. So I am, I'm just gonna go right to the question. I think if you wanna find out more about my background, you can do all that online on my website. So I've been on my anti-racism journey for just a few years, and I recognize that I still have a lot to learn and probably will for some time. Uh, for me, a pivotal point in my journey was when I was in grad school studying urban planning and learning about how we built history and built cities over time. When, and that was when Johnny Rush was so brutally attacked in downtown. And something clicked, something hit me, and I realized that I had been fairly passive or complicit and just kind of observatory, and that I needed to activate and begin um, approaching things and challenging systems and using my voice and my privilege and the power that's been bestowed to me to make change. So when I think about racial equity and what it means and what it looks like in Asheville, I think about the history that I learned in school. I think about 400 years of oppressive systems, if not longer. Um, I think that a lot of what we are experiencing now is the culmination of those 400 years, but really put into place in the last 80 to 100 years of policy. And I think now we are we have these systems and structures and policies that have intentionally left out huge parts of our community, Black Ashfillians and families from economic growth, from housing, from um, educational and leadership positions, and basically everything that bestows power and wealth building on any individual. And I think in Asheville, that literally translates to having large disparities, gaps in our education between black and white children. That means we have vast differences in housing security and ownership and generational wealth building between black and white families. I think it means that we have greater rates of profiling and policing and crimes on black neighbors. And I think it all adds up to different rates of access and healthcare and leadership in general. And so for me, I interpreted this question as like, how do I understand um, racial equity? And then how do I vision 
what a racially equitable Asheville would look like. So I think if, if we had an equitable Asheville, then we would have parity. We would have no fear. We wouldn't have fear of police. We wouldn't have, um, is that a time countdown? Okay. Is that mean one minute or one, two seconds? Five seconds. I'm sorry. I didn't know what it meant. Okay. Um, I'll just finish my sentence. Um, that it would mean no more fear of losing your home or where your children would be growing up or what their access to education would be. It would mean that we all have access to all the things we need, whether it's housing and schooling and safety, and that all of us in our community would be thriving together and not just surviving or barely making an existence. Thank you. So that's two and a half minutes. I am going to, you all, if you all can see me, I will put up five to let you know that you got like five seconds, you got to wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. I didn't realize. Thank you, Sage. I should have said that earlier. I do apologize. Rich, you're next. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rich Lee. And like Sage, I, um, I'm going to use my time to answer the question. And I welcome anybody who's interested to get in contact with me to learn more about me personally. Um, I guess my, my, Constant, my understanding of racial equity um, begins when I moved back here um, to Asheville back in the late 90s. And even then, there was the feeling that Asheville was a city that was hostile to its low income residents and its residents of color in a lot of ways. And actually, the census that we're doing this year is, you know, likely to show that Asheville, even as it's boomed as a city, has lost black population for, um, for a multitude of reasons. And so as somebody who has made this place my home and is raising my kids here, making sure that this is a place that is able to maintain its diversity, its history, and its creative vitality is something that's really important to me. I've been spending the last couple of months since the council passed the um, reparations resolution looking into the, um, the economics and of um, urban renewal and the legacy of slavery and segregation in the city of Asheville. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. And one of the things that stuck out to me is that in 1963, um, the year of de desegregation of a lot of schools, the Civil Rights Act, the gap between black wealth and white wealth in America was more than 20 fold. The median black family had more than 20 times the wealth of the median um, black family in Asheville. And to me, what that reflects is that the legacy of slavery and the legacy of Jim Crow and segregation put already more than 60 years ago um, black households and black families at a disadvantage, including here in Asheville, that no amount of just trying to make um, equitable policy and, equi and declare things to be equitable going forward is going to correct. And that's why I support the racial, um, the reparations resolution. We have to find a way to return that wealth that was stolen from black families in Nashville. Thank you, Rich. We'll go to Kim Roney. You're next. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to these important issues with our neighbors as we approach the need for a just recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, economic instability, and systemic racism, and climate change. These are emergencies that are affecting all of us. Um, my name is Kim Roney. I'm a piano teacher and a service industry worker and a community organizer. What racial equity means to me is access to resources and opportunity. And when I see the, the, the graphic is often used to explain this, as a baseball fan, I see three children trying to watch the baseball game, game and all are at different heights, but they can't see over the fence. And so I see these boxes placed underneath them equally, but they can't all still see. And so then I see how in the next picture, there's boxes placed at different levels. So I think about what Bell Hooks says about this being an imperialist white supremacy, capitalist patriarchy, and how it's in all of us. And as a white woman, 
on Cherokee ground that was um, taken from indigenous peoples in a land built on the stolen labor of enslaved Africans and as a white woman um, in a white supremacist society. Um, I'm seeing a need for us to take down that fence because who chooses who builds those boxes, who gets which boxes, how fast they come and for how long they stay. Um, and so what I think I understand from my students and my families that are in close community with and from my neighbors is that because of racial bias and because of systemic racism and oppression, um, white supremacy is showing up with outcomes in our schools with an opportunity gap that is um, heartbreaking and embarrassing in our community and not necessary, but it was done on purpose. It shows up in lack of affordable housing and home ownership and land access for community gardens, for green spaces, but also for houses because neighborhoods aren't just built around houses. It's about everything that makes a neighborhood unique and special. It's about um, access to low wage jobs and what we need is living wage and dignified work. Um, it shows up in our tree canopy when trees are taken down from what was once public housing and is now Hakka housing um, for surveillance. It shows up when my friend in the music industry is stopped seven weeks in a row by the APT on the way home from work, and I know that wouldn't happen to me. Thank you. And Keith Young. Hey, everybody. Uh, quick mic check. Can you hear me pretty good? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, the, the issue of racial equity, first I wanna say it's not just a city of Asheville issue. Uh, this is an issue, these are issues that local municipalities and uh, diverse communities across our country have to wrestle with within a larger context of American history, even to uh, present day with our policing disparities and deaths of so many uh, black men and women in this country. And so from the inception of our country, uh, governments and local, regional, uh, state and federal at the federal levels uh, have basically played a significant role in creating and maintaining racial inequity, including everything from determining who is a citizen, who can vote, uh, who can own property, who is property, uh, and where one person can live. And so governmental laws and practices and policies uh, basically uh, created a racial hierarchy and determined basically on race who benefits and who is burdened. So when you look at our, our system in this country where all men are supposed to be created equal, uh, they really meant men and not women. They meant white people and not people of color and uh, people with property and not those without. So if you fast forward to the present day, our current inequities are sustained uh, by these historical legacies and structures and systems that repeat patterns of exclusion. Um, you know, from the civil rights movement. One of the successes of the civil rights movement was making racial discrimination illegal. However, despite that sort of progress, explicit discrimination um, was, was, was kind of outlawed, but the racial inequities continue to be deep, uh, pervasive, um, and persistent across our entire country. So unfortunately, what we have witnessed is the morphing of explicit bias into implicit bias uh, with implicit bias perpetuated by institutional policies and practices. And these policies and practices basically replicate the same racially inequitable outcomes uh, that previously existed. And what we need to do is, is, is take this whole historical context and fix some of the racial inequities, fix some of the inequities, uh, you know, in the areas of healthcare and education, criminal justice system, uh, black business ownership, home ownership, uh, overall equity, and generational wealth. So I'll stop. I won't even go to the five minutes because I could go on and on. Okay. I was trying to get it all in like a motorboat. But <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Do you want to be having any follow-ups before we move on? No. Um, okay. No. Not at this time. Well, we had quite a number of questions come in from the community. Um, and before we get to those, however, we do want to turn to um, a very specific and special demographic in our community, and that is our youth. So representing that group is Tasia Etheridge. Tasia, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Can everyone hear me all right? 
Yes. And Kasia will um, ask a couple of questions that have come in from our young people here in our community. Kasia, take it away. All right. So um, I guess I'll ask these questions and I'll go in the same order, which is Sage, Rich, um, Kim, Keith, just to keep things fluid. Um, so the first one is, can you name programs or activities currently active in Nashville that center Black youth and success? Uh, I think I'm first. Uh, I know of In Real Life, and um, my daddy taught me that, or the two that he's recently reading about and working with. Rich, you next. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, I also, you know, I know my daddy taught me that. Um, I also I recently rolled off the board of Green Opportunities and their programs for um, teenage and later than teenage students is something that um, I've seen a lot of a lot of good success from Kitchen Ready programs, Southside Kitchen, and such. Are all the questions two minute time limits? Because there's a bunch of them. No, no, but we <laughs> just, just know that when it comes to equity, sure. right? You're also watching how we operate in community with one another. So I'll add um, word on the street. Um, I've been following CoThink and the youth that are showing up there. Um, the Vosilis Povenets, um, gosh, uh, YTL. Um, there's so many, and our, our youth are showing up together in intergenerational leadership and centering themselves, and that is powerful because they're filling the gaps where um, we need to build bridges, where walls have been built before. Thank you, Kim. Keith? Yeah, I'll just um, piggyback off of some of the ones that everybody else has said. You know, everybody knows my daddy taught me that. I think everybody knows uh, YTL, which was previously headed up by uh, Libby. Um, I think you got writers in schools that do some work, and you got Kayla, um, and and that's those are some of the ones that come to mind off the top of my head. Good, thank you all. Um, my next question is, um, and it starts with a statement: the accessibility of extracurricular activities designed for and with Black youth in mind are limited limited in this city. How do you plan to make Asheville a safe space for Black youth, provide resources via the reparations resolution that bolsters Black success, and address racial inequities in Black primary, secondary, and higher education within Asheville? Am I going first again? Okay, and I'm seeing the question in the comments here, so in the chat, so let me see. How do you plan to make Asheville a safe space for black youth, provide via the of reparations. Um, I'm going to go right to uh, reparations um, in my answer because I think it's um, not only an important topic right now, but I think it's the root of many of these things. Um, my background and specialty is in housing, particularly affordable housing, and I've been working on the city's affordable housing for a number of years, four or five years, and when I think of reparations, I know that I have a limited scope from my um, perspective, but one of the things that sticks out to me is restoring that ownership, restoring home ownership and business ownership, but primarily that home ownership that has been lost that has triggered so much loss of generational wealth. And I think um, when we look at the education gap for children, we have kind of what's happening in the school system and how the state is funding it and not funding it and how we're supplementing that. But then we also have what happens outside the school system. And a lot of my concerns are around how our children are being cared for before and after school. So I think that plays right into reparations and restoring home ownership and getting kids into better situations where their families have more access and generational wealth. But it also speaks to um, what's happening before and after school and the programs that are creating safe space for black youth to be empowered and to provide resources for them. And also, translates into higher education potential. Thank you, Sage. Rich, you're next. Do you need the question again? No, I think I've got it. Um, 
One of the things that I'm most excited to see um, adopted as um, out of the reparations discussion, but also out of discussions that we had um, in the campaign in 2015 um, when Keith and I were running and in 2017 when Kim and I were running is for the city to finally make progress on participatory budgeting. And just really quickly, that is um, a process that was initiated in New York and also in Brazil. It was first adopted in North Carolina in Greensboro. And it is giving communities and individual neighborhoods portions of local budgets to use local bottom-up decision-making instead of top-down decision-making to decide what to do with them. And we know when we talk about, um, for example, um, defunding the police and um, how to, ways that are not enforcement-based to um, ensure public safety and community safety, we know that community programs and community support programs like after-school programs, um, like the ones we just named, are important parts of, um, of um, deterring youth from crime and that but I, as a um, potential city council member, I really want to see, I'm excited to see what neighborhoods generate if given the power and the, um, and the authority to have that discussion on a neighborhood level, on a community level, and um, have, have real financial teeth behind it. So one of the things I would like to commit to if I'm elected to city council is to adopt a participatory budgeting um, model within my first term and if the community is supportive of it to have that be part of the process of putting reparations into place for black Asheville. I'm so grateful our youth are leaving um, questions to this forum. Um, when I talk to my students um, 18 of them who that I've known since elementary school graduated from Asheville High and Sosa this year. And what I hear is that the city has no love for them. There's no jobs that pay There's so that they can afford to stay. Um, there's not housing. They see their parents struggling on two incomes and still not able to make it. Um, and it's time to leave. And that tells me that we're losing our greatest resource, which is our people, because they don't feel that there's a place here. So some ways that we can start, um, I think about the fact that neighborhoods aren't just housing, it's all the things that make a neighborhood special. And that means um, we need our community centers, which are already named in um, community plans like the Burton Street community, to be a place with expanded hours, especially on the weekends, for our students and their families to study, play, build community, and have training programs. Um, we need safe places. Um, we need to remove barriers to participation um, when it comes to housing. This means not only investing in the community land trust by and for our current families and for future generations, but it means um, building towards an anti-discrimination housing ordinance across the state for our LGBTQ youth and our BIPOC youth that are so vulnerable. Um, it means that we do need participatory budgeting, which many people have brought in, including um, Councilwoman Shanika Smith, but not just a group of small amounts of funds that we give to nonprofits to distribute because we need grassroots efforts so that a middle schooler who sees the need to repave a basketball court because they want to build community and play outside together, um, that it would be decided by and for the community. Um, you could tie that in with what it means for reparations and also what it means for us to have climate justice with a race and class analysis as I hear students who want to invest in community gardens but want to make sure the soil is healthy to grow food in. Um, so it's about every single part that makes a place um, welcoming to be. And what I hear from so many of our Black, Brown, and Indigenous youth is that um, the city doesn't feel like a place that's welcoming to them. So when I remember the story from a few years ago with an officer that approached three of our um, youth with a semi-automatic assault rifle, I know that wouldn't have happened to my students that look like me. And so I think about, is that the kind of culture that we are all together complicit in um, and inviting our youth to be here and to be welcome? Um, because I think that's something that we all have the best interest in changing for a healthy, 
society and for the well-being so that our our, pe our young people will not only want to um, be here, but um, so we'll see a return investment when they want to return and we've addressed the equity issues in our schools because I want to grow their families here as well. Thank you. Keith. All right. Um, let's see. How do you plan to make Asheville a safe space for black youth, provide resources via the reparations resolution that bolster black success and address racial inequities and in black primary, secondary, and higher education within Asheville? Well, pretty much like any issue that you deal with through uh, a racial equity lens, it's gonna be complex. Um, like I stated before, current inequities are sustained by the historical legacies of systems that repeat exclusion. Uh, a lot of this is all about opportunity, an opportunity that is unabated and not blocked based on the color of your skin, um, the inequities of generational wealth. Um, how do we make Asheville a safe space for our black youth? One, we can decriminalize being black in itself um, by working with, uh, uh, you know, how we deal with uh, uh, police, um, how do we provide resources via the reparations resolution? It's my personal mission to continue the efforts of the reparations resolution and look for opportunities that will be able to provide financial assistance to the community to bolster black success in the, in these, in the ranges of uh, obtaining property uh, through grants, uh, obtaining business uh, funds through grants, bolstering black success, allowing individuals to uh, uh, create generational wealth in some way, shape, or form. And then when you start to talk about secondary and higher education with that, within Asheville, I always look at that through a, a spectrum of your social economic standing, uh, especially like right now during COVID-19. So when you look at, you know, I'm not going to say that all Black youth are impoverished in this city, but there is a great deal that is. And so when you look at it through that, through that, through that lens of what we're facing right now through our school-age children, how many of those parents are able to stay home with their kids and be able to teach them and sit right there with them while their teachers are, are working with them, especially our younger ones? That has a lot to do with your social economic standing where you may have uh, two parents in a household or one parent can work from home and there's, there's enough funds coming in where you can, you have that sort of luxury. And so those kids who have that ability, they thrive in school anyway. But when you take them out of that situation and they have that ability uh, outside the home as well, what does that say about the kids that are turning on their computer at 8 a.m. in the morning who are in the first grade, second grade, and they may have an old, older sibling at home who's kind of doing their thing in school too, and mom or dad or both parents, if both parents are in the home, are out at work. There's a social economic gap, and that gap is caused by uh, the sustained historical leg legacies of the inequities that we have. And so it all comes back in my mind to unabated opportunity uh, for generational wealth and be able to put your family in a position where they can be successful in this in this world, where they can live in a better uh, neighborhood if they choose, where they can have a better job if they have the, the, the opportunity to do so. And so when we talk about all of these things, it goes back to what racial equity is. And it's essentially when race can no longer be used to predict the life outcomes of yourself or group. And when that happens, overall, everybody is improved. I always like to say a rising tide lifts all boats, but all boats aren't built to ride the wave. So when we start talking about how do we make our black youth safe and, and, and what are we going to do to bolster black success and, 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 and shorten that gap of, of the educational spectrum, it all goes back to, you know, our first question that you asked us, racial equity. And how do we change those uh, life outcomes by removing race from it? and by providing the generational wealth and the unabated opportunities that families can have. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, my uh, Wi-Fi cut out briefly, uh, but I think I would like to follow up with like, in regards to higher education and not everyone has to answer this just if you feel called to, um, but what would you do within your role at city council to provide um, access to higher education in Western North Carolina schools? And I'm thinking along like the UNCA AVID scholarship, which is something, but you know, 
not enough for our black community. I'm happy to chime in for a second. I'm sorry, Keith. I'm not sure what order you want to go in. Um, I heard Sage, but then Keith afterwards. Uh, Maybe first. Okay. Um, and you know, I think what we're really trying to do is have a conversation here. So I'll just throw out some things that um, we've been talking about in some circles recently, and that is really around um, not just education gap, but retention of teachers and educators. And I think there could be some momentum both uh, at a elementary school and high school and college level where uh, educators and administrators come together and really focus on ways that we can um, retain our lifelong educators and create educators from our children and retain them in our community and build those relationships. And then I think that there could potentially be some scholarship programs or grant programs assembled to help some of these youth and assist them financially in getting into schools and into these trainings. Um, similar to, you know, we mentioned my daddy taught me that, and uh, when I was in high school, it was junior achievement. But how are we how are we funding opportunities for children to learn ways to reach towards higher education and get the training and get the internship? And I think we could be doing more on that front. Um, yeah, that's all I want to share. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, you know, the city of Asheville right now has a, a program that was spearheaded by our former mayor, uh, Terry Bellamy, the first black mayor of the city, and it was uh, CALA, which stands for the City of Asheville um, Youth Leadership Academy. And, you know, there are the students in that program, they do, uh, they do internships, and we've partnered with a bunch of different businesses where they can do that at. Um, there's some um, community service aspects of that. There's some summer workshops uh, that they do in that. And then that program, I believe, was implemented in 2007. And from 2007 until now, um, we've sent many students off to college and given at least $1.8 million uh, for higher education. So that's a program that the city of Asheville is doing, but there's way more opportunity to be able to partner with outside organizations and bolster that program or build, build a new in other areas with different partnerships. So um, it may not, you know, a lot of times there are things that are out there that people just don't know about. I don't know if a lot of folks even know about Kayla, but it's, it's a really good program. Um, there's been a lot of kids that have gone off to higher education and there's been a lot of scholarship money given to that. Um, we could possibly try to bolster that and build that. And so I think that's one way that we can help, uh, help foster what you're talking about. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to that or I'll move on to my last question? If I could just add really quickly, I think um, that for one thing, one of the one of the things the city controls most directly about the our educational system is the way um, people are chosen for the city school board. And I, I've come around to the field, the, um, a decision that I would support an elected city school board as a way of providing accountability um, at the school district, similar to the way the county school board um, operates. The one other thing I'd just really quickly say is, you know, getting into college is one challenge that um, local black youth and white youth face, but staying in college through economic pressures like, um, like paying tuition, paying rent, um, are other ways, are other challenges that make it more difficult for people who come from low-income backgrounds to stay in college. And so, like Sage was talking about with housing programs earlier, um, programs like rental assistance, like down payment assistance that gave college students um, housing security during their college years is a way to that the city could operate to keep people um, who've already been um, have already been accepted in the college to keep them through that track to getting their degree. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one last follow-up thought, and I think Keith is probably where it is. We, um, through the housing and HDB committees and boards, we moment, do. Is that who's speaking? Is that Sage speaking? Oh, I'm sorry, that's Sage. Yes, that's Sage. Uh, Kim, I was going to say speak, and you had not had a moment to oh. speak to this yet. I'm so sorry because I can't see everyone. Hard to tell on Zoom. That's why Dewana and I are here. 
My apologies, Kim. No worries. Um, I am seeing in the chat that um, because we're a community that's woven together and we need each other for these just transitions to a more equitable society, um, we are going to rely on each other for some of these programs. So it, whether it's honoring Mayor Bellamy for her work with the Kayla program, um, Sally in the chat is bringing up what the AVID program uh, makes available. But I have to tie this together. Like if, if our, we are not going to have economic development and good paying jobs um, that provide living wages for dignified work, if we don't heal our opportunity gap in our schools, because I don't understand why, or I do understand why someone who has been to school here um, as a black, brown, indigenous person wouldn't want to stay and go to UNCA um, if we don't treat our, um, our people well. So I think it starts um, at a young age with early education. Um, we do need accountability, as Rich named, with looking at what uh, accountability for our school board means. Um, we need resources for our teachers. We need hiring bonuses for teachers um, that are black, brown, and indigenous that um, have the lived experience of our students um, so they can shepherd them with our community um, to have a greater success. So I think that this is all about the attitude of our community. And it's not just one part because we, as entrepreneurs, that don't live single issue lives. Great. Um, and uh, Tasha is going to ask, we, we are running short on time, as was to be expected. So we are going to start limiting things to about a minute maybe a little less per question. And because Tasia's next question um, is one that many of you in the community were asking, some version of this question, we're going to go ahead with that before going to the other community questions and then following up with your questions before each other. Tasia. Alrighty. Um, the last one, um, but one that resonates a lot with me is what is your stance on the defundment of the Asheville Police Department, or rather divestment and investment? Um, if for it, where would you lobby for that within City Council? If you're against it, where do you plan to come up with the money and resources to assure that the terrorism on Black communities and Black youth stops? Who would you like to see go first, Tasha? Um, I'll, I'll go with Keith. Okay. Oh. Can you restate that first part? You kind of cut out. I heard something about, anyway, where money would go or something like that, but it cut out. Yeah. What is your stance on the defundment of APD or rather divestment and investment? Um, if for, where would you lobby for that money to be dispersed? And then if against, where do you plan to come up with the money and resources to assure that the terrorism in Black communities and Black youth stops? Got it. So... As it pertains to defunding the police, I think, you know, black people in this country are dealing with issues, again, systemic in nature. And um, it's interesting for me because I think a lot of people think just because you take the money away, that stops the way that I'm being policed as a black man. So I want to separate the two. So the money issue is good in a sense of if you defund police, you have more money to go in other areas that could supplement community activities and how we reimagine policing. My main concern is just because you move the money, does that change the way police police me or uh, another black person in the city? And so I support looking at the police budget. Uh, we're doing that right now. What sort of funds are going to come from that? I don't know. I think it's interesting in the sense of if we had all the money that we needed from a police budget today, can we immediately take that money and put it into something else that is going to affect the way that we are reimagining policing and is the infrastructure going to be set up? And every question that I've asked of everybody, um, and I'm pretty sure everybody has an opinion, the answer to that is we don't have the infrastructure right now, today, to put that money into something. So where does that money need to go? And in my opinion, I think that money needs to go into a uh, startup for a reparations fund. Um, I, it, it's my idea to have a perpetual fund that is in perpetuity, uh, where the principal never gets touched and the residual is always allocated 
uh, to the black community in the forms of grants for uh, businesses, uh, homes, land purchases, whatsoever. And then moving forward, take a look at defunding the police and reimagining policing, not just in this budget cycle, but in every budget cycle and how we can continually have a plan with infrastructure set up to reimagine police. I'm sorry, it's not a lot of time to answer that complex question. Good question though. Yes, thank you. And sorry, we're getting cut so short on such a big one. But um, I'll go ahead and go to Rich. Okay. Um, so, yes, I, I think the evidence shows that we could reduce police funding without um, sacrificing um, the safety of the community, and especially the, the safety of um, the um, underinvested, um, low income, and marginalized neighborhoods that see the worst of crime it really um to be honest it scares me to think of making a um, dramatic police cut without having the replacement community programs and um, crisis response and other supports in place and to, it worries it it makes me afraid to see that what if we do this and there is a spike in shootings like there have been in a few cities that saw police shut, shut slowdowns which police slowdowns when police or work stoppages are some of the best evidence out there that we could have less enforcement heavy policing less police on the street and not and still feel the same um or better sense of safety in the city but in a few cities there were increased shootings and there were increased um crimes that victimized um, non-white communities. So it scares me to consider doing it without a deep and probably longer than this one budget cycle community conversation about how we're going to build up the community supports and the other things that are proven to, um, to keep crime low and to not put black lives at the end of a loss of freedom or a loss of their lives or the other impacts of our sort of enforcement first status quo of policing that we've had so far. Thank you. Kim? Thank you for this, um, presenting this important question, Tasia. Um, I continue to stand with Black AVL demands and intergenerational Black, Brown, and Indigenous leadership calling for the 50% um, funds of APD to be divested from current use in APD and invested in long-term safety strategies for our community. I know that there's work already being done in our community that needs to be amplified. But what we know from the history of policing is that by its very nature, it's violent. Um, by design, it is for property protection and has a history of slave patrols. Um, so when I realize that my tax dollars are being used to harm my neighbors, I know that that's my fault, that I've been complicit in allowing that to continue as a culture in our community. At last night's council meeting, I heard that APD, um, you know, brutalized protesters that were standing up for Black Lives Matter and during peaceful protests were tear gassed and that council was not responsible. We are all responsible when that happens to our neighbors. So what it needs to go to, I need you to tell me, and then I need you to hold me accountable for action. And I am committed to listening and following up with meaningful action. So in this short time period, I'll just say, we're gonna need a community engagement process that's massive um, for a just recovery from the harm that's been done. And then I think that leaves me and um, great point by all candidates, and I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I do support reimagining and investing and in investing differently. Um, I, alongside Rich, have concerns. So I, as someone that is part of the dominant white culture and hasn't lived the experience of being policed as a person of color, I am concerned that I don't fully understand it uh, or the need. And so to me, the process looks like we need a lot of input and that we need to go through um, a planning stage and that it may take more time than we really hoped um, would. Um, that said, I think we have some naturally occurring opportunities right now. We are losing officers quickly. I think we are down 19 or so officers and 
perhaps we'll lose more. So, you know, this idea that can we retain public safety and the needs that we have in our community with fewer officers, we're experimenting with that right now. And I hope that we are watching and collecting data on this so that we can make educated decisions about the impacts of that. Uh, I know we're also in the middle of a pandemic and the situation may be a little different um, if we were not. Um, but it's an opportunity to learn from while we're going through the transition and seeing the attrition, natural attrition of officers. Um, I, you know, I want to support the process. So I think I'm just going to continue to listen and engage and see where it does make sense and where, if we, if the question is, do you support and what would you invest in? I think there is a lot of mental health needs and that those are being exacerbated by COVID right now. So when, if a call is made for someone that's having a mental health crisis, I don't necessarily think a police officer should be the one that responds. Someone that excels in mental health. Or if we have a houseless community member that is having an, a situation, then we would send someone who can help them find housing. And, you know, those are just very different. Um, I can see your hand. I'm sorry. It's a new way of doing things, but it's time to look at it. Thank you. And thank you all for answering these questions for me. I'll pass it over. Thank you. So now is the public question section. And so we received a lot of questions from the public. And I would like to thank all of the um, public comments who submitted questions. And I will start off with this question. The city destroys Stevens Lee Building in the dark of the night, a place of historical significance and cultural impact. How is the history of Stevens Lee relevant to you and your role as a city council member? What do you think is the role of the city in addressing the history of education of black youth in Asheville? And so I would like to start, um, I guess I can start with you, Keith, and we'll work our way up. Okay, I think the first part of that was, what's the significance of Stevens Lee? Um, I think I see the question coming in the chat. Hold on, let me read it. How is the history of Stevens Lee relevant to you and your role as a city council member? Um, and what do you think is the role of city in addressing the history of education of black youth in Asheville. Huh. Well, so for me, you know, both of my parents graduated from Stevens Lee. Um, my mom went to the all girls private school of Allen and then she transferred over to Stevens Lee. And so as a kid, uh, I remember my parents going to all these high school reunions with all their friends and the camaraderie and hearing about the stories of the great Stevens Lee marching band and how they won basketball championships and football championships and that's where I got to meet a lot of my parents' friends, including uh, now Commissioner Mr. Al Whitesides, who is a member of my church. And just, you know, he graduated from there. And just, there's a rich history in the black community that spans a generation um, for what Stevens Lee means to us. Even me, who never attended Stevens Lee, never even saw what the school looked like on the inside, except for when I was a kid going to Stevens Lee through the city youth programs um, that that uh, they had at the time where Stevens Lee was everything to me as a youth, going to play basketball there and shoot pool and, and fraternize with my friends. Um, so that's the significance of what it means to me. And what do I think is my role in addressing the history of education of black youth in Asheville? I would say addressing the, 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 the history aspect of it in education is what Stevens Lee stood for. Um, I went to a historically black college and university in Virginia State University, and I understand that the majority of my professors were black. And when I had conversations with my parents and people who went to Stevens Lee, there was that same kind of, of aspect of black excellence, of your teachers expected more of you. I never had a black teacher throughout um, uh, my entire elementary and, high, and middle school and high school career here in Nashville, except for one teacher who was a science teacher. I'm going on and on. These are important questions. They deserve more time. Um, there is an aspect of black excellence that we have lost in our school system that we need to recapture in short. I wish I could say more. Golly. I'm sure the public would love it if you all would stay on even longer beyond 8.30. 
um, Kim? Yeah, we could all bring our Snuggies and stay in for a six or seven hour council meeting, right? Keith, <laughs> you've offered so much to our community <laughs> and the time and commitment you put in um, as a dad and um, with uh, your excellence in your service. So what Stevens Lee represents to me, um, and I will just start out with like, I'm a gentrifier, right? I've only lived here since 2006. So I'm learning about what happened and I'm unlearning white supremacy and myself at the same time. So what I understand and I hear and I acknowledge is the truth is that Stevens Lee represents community and it represents black excellence and it represents a place of learning and healing where, uh, where students, families and community not only felt truly valued, but invested value and saw return on investment. So what does it mean for city council members to hear the concerns of the community, like those listening sessions that have been having in our community with um, middle school and high school age uh, female identifying students? Um, what is it like to be a student in Asheville right now? Our students are holding us accountable right now. And I would love for this to be a time and a place where we come together acknowledge the truth of what has happened, um, set an intent to restore and repair through reparations, um, through land use, through planning, um, for our students to join us in a cause and to look back on this moment, just like we look back on Stevens Lee and acknowledge this point in history as a time when adults pulled it together and the youth wanted to join in. Is it me? All right, Rich. Yeah. So um, I guess the first part of your question, um, I've definitely gotten to see um, the the benefits the, of the legacy of Stevens Lee in the work of um, Ms. Orly Simmons, uh, Reverend Ray, uh, Nina Simone, and other um, alumni. Um, I guess when it comes to the, the question of academic excellence, I was just thinking about this um, about that, that statistic that's been going around for a while that um, the best predictor of academic success for a black student, or one of the best predictors of academic success for a black student is having two black teachers during their school career. And um, I'm thinking about my kids who um, are students at Hall Fletcher and um, Isaac Dixon and um, you know, third, fourth, fifth, and fifth grade and haven't had a black teacher yet in their school system. And I think we lost something when we lost um, black students taught meaningfully you know, by um, these black teachers that um, Dewana mentioned that have masters and PhD degrees. And um, I don't know if it's possible to recapture that in um, Asheville City Schools as it's constituted now, but um, that's something that would be meaningful to a lot of my kids' classmates and to them too, I'm sure. Sage? Um, you know, I too am learning about the history of Stephen Lee tonight, and it reminds me of some of the early equity and inclusion training I did when I was asked how old were you when you had your first black teacher? And frankly, my answer was no age. I never had one. And that was the turning point in my understanding of the importance of seeing people that look like you in positions of power and how that elevates you to understand that you too can have power. Um, so I appreciate this history and what I've learned from others tonight. Um, as far as uh, what is the role of the city in addressing the history of education? I would think that perhaps the best thing we could do to address the history is to uh, correct the future. And I am, I think many of us are disappointed and alarmed by the growing education gap. And I'm not seeing a lot of accountability on council to address it. And I'm wondering why the school board and the city council no longer have joint meetings. I'm wondering why council isn't getting regular updates on these gaps and um, actionable items and what's happening and why isn't it getting better and if it's not then how do we have new measurables and create new tools and new action items and i'm wondering if i'm just wondering where the why it's not more discussed at a council level and how do we hold that more accountable and i hope that's something that we all engage on because we can't just get an update once a year and say gosh that's a mess it's not enough it's a complete disservice and disrespect to our youth and I think to 
correct the past, we have to understand that we really have to focus on the future. Great. Thank you all so much. So in the interest of time, we're going to turn to, we'll come back to other questions because we do have others coming in or that came in, but we're going to turn to a portion of the program that we hope will be really interesting. And that is where the candidates, you all ask each other questions. And so why don't we switch up the order and start with Kim. What is your one question for the rest of the candidates? <sighs> and I will say at this point, you point to who you want, the order you want the, the, the folks to answer. So this is candidate engagement here. And we'll see about one minute to answer the questions. Okay. Um, I've been thinking about this because we've, we've um, unfortunately, Sandra can't be with us today, but we've been in the room a lot together and you're my neighbors and I love you and I want us all to be able to work together um, to realize the hopes and dreams of our neighbors um, by removing the barriers that are in the way because there's an opportunity for joy and celebration. So, oof. In order for us to have joy and celebration, we have to tell the truth. Every single one of us, myself and the other candidates that are on this forum, have been in the room during 2017 when there was an election cycle, um, when we were in service on boards and commissions, um, when we were seated on city council um, with the leadership of Councilman Young, when there was a deep conversation happening about if we were going to invest $1.2 million in additional policing for downtown Asheville, in the face of community cries to invest in long-term safety strategies. So this conversation isn't new, it's been ongoing. In the midst of that conversation, each one of us used our voices and are on the public record stating our position on what that would mean and, and how the, that decision should be influenced. And my heart is broken because Devana, you made me cry first during that last, uh, the very first uh, candidate council forum, um, asking some of these same questions. And in the summer of 2017, while our community was having this big conversation, divest and best, divest and best, Johnny Rush was brutally attacked by the police walking home from work because the bus doesn't run and because he didn't have access to a car. And that's on all of us. So. We are going to one day very soon because we care about each other and we care about our community. We are going to look back on this moment and whether we chose hope and whether we chose to invest in our community or not. But my, I guess my question is like, are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And are you willing to join me in an effort to roll back the decision in 2017 to divest the 1.2 million and then remove the nine officers to divest from 50% to really imagine public safety and end policing as we know it so that we can heal the people on the planet and we can be proud of this moment. Will you join me in it? So, um, is that specific to a specific it's for all, It's for all of our okay. Thank you, Duana. It's for all of our neighbors because it matters to me because I care about you. Um, let's start with you, um, say. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, I can sense the emotion. And I think I understood the question to be, will we join you in this effort to divest and invest and change the pathway forward? And my answer to that would be yes. Um, I too was there in 2017 and partook in some of those rooms and sat at those tables and um, made conscious decisions and choices and votes and in shared input based on what I believed to be happening at the time. And um, it was later that year that Johnny Rush was so brutally attacked and um, started to change my thinking as well. Uh, you know, and I have to own that I do not share in the policing um, that other community members have experienced. And I think it's just, we have to reckon with that. I have to reckon with that, I have to own that, and I have to listen more because of it. So yes, yes, I would join you in that. Um, 
Rich. Okay. Um, I, I also remember very strongly Duana from that policing forum in 2017. And um, I also have to own that my thinking about what police reform and the best invest could look like has changed since 2017. Um, I thought that there could be a piecemeal reform or a set of smaller reforms that would meaningfully earn the police back the trust of the community and reduce violence on black bodies. And it hasn't happened. And I don't believe that's the case anymore. So I do support that if elected by the end of my first term, I would, um, see a reduction in the police force in Asheville. Keith. Y'all see this young man right here? This is my son. This is Keith Young Jr. Tell him hey. Hi. All right. You go first. Um to me Yes, on the surface, yes, that best, then best, of course. But like I said before, it's more than just money to me because like I was pulled over the night of an election during my first election and was harassed by police asking what was I doing when I was putting out signs at a precinct. I've been pulled over several times in my life. I've had many interactions with police um, that, that shape who I am as a person. So when we talk about that best and then best, we got to do it the right way. It can't just be a money solution because to me, it's way bigger than that. It's about that young man who just came in here and said, hey, to everybody, that's my son. So the, the choices that I make, you know, I don't want my son to be somebody that ends up with the knee on his neck uh, because of decisions that we make. I don't want my daughter or my kids or anybody else's kids that look like me to be affected adversely, adversely because of police. So it's. I, I, I respect the divest and invest, and I truly want it to work, but I need it to work. I need it to work. Not that I want it to work, I need it to work because the decisions that I make about police are gonna affect that young man. And when he's 15 years old and his two front teeth aren't missing and he doesn't have curly cute hair, he's gonna look like a predator to somebody because that's what the world has told them he is. And so I need this divest and invest stuff to really work, not just be a buzzword, not just be something that people think, oh, we're going to do this and everything's going to be a uh, kumbaya moment. No, it's got to work for me because my son could lose his life. I could lose my life somewhere else in this country where people don't know who Keith Young is. And so that is, I agree with you, Kim, and I agree with everybody else who does the divest and invest and defund police, but I need it to work for my boy, for my daughter. So it is way more important for me to get it right as opposed to being a political or whatever it is. And I'm sorry I got emotional about that, but that's just how I feel. Great, thank you, Keith. And since you were the last to speak, why don't we turn it over to you to ask you a question of the panel? I, I never, I didn't prepare a question for everybody, but since we ended, since I ended on that, that note of, of, of divest and invest, I'll just continue on that same line. And it is more of, a statement and you can say how you feel or you can use this for whatever, but we have to understand that in, in, in my mind, the way policing works, police aren't preventative in my mind. Like when you call police, something has already happened. It's already happened. For whatever reason, when you are reaching out to call the police, something has already happened to you. What I need to happen is that when I call police to come help me, I won't be looked at as a suspect when they get there. And so when we start talking about reimagining police, this concept is way bigger than money because all of these people that went around this country and marched uh, due to the, the, the death of George Floyd as being a catalyst to this movement, it's more than just about George Floyd. It's about all the people who have lost their lives over the years, over and over again due to police. It's more than just taking money away from the police and putting it in a social program that may or may not work and I still end up dead or hurt or beat up. And so what my question to you all would be is, can you look at this objectively and understand that 
whatever we do to reimagine police, people's lives are at stake. And I'm not talking about the folks who don't have instances with police. I'm talking about people that look like me, who can drive out of City Hall and get pulled over after a council meeting. And then you find out who I am and it's, oh, go on by your way. That's what I'm talking about. Can you understand that people's lives are at stake and take a uh, prudent approach and how this will adversely affect my son? Keith, who would you like to answer that first? Anybody who wants to, or they can say whatever. It, it doesn't matter. It's kind of a statement and, you know. One minute, everyone. Sage? Um, I appreciate the passion and that perspective, Keith. And I just have a quick answer that I will do the best that I can. And mm. uh, yeah, I will. I will try and be objective and realize that people's lives are at risk. Rich? Keith, I really appreciate you um, putting this issue in the context of it not necessarily being um, less policing or more policing, but policing that protects you. And while you were um, while you were talking, it reminded me of um, a quote I read this summer from the journalist Joe Leavy, who um, who um, kind of echoes that sentiment in a really um, eloquent way. And that's not to say you weren't eloquent, but she said, "Like the schoolyard bully, our criminal justice system harasses people on small pretexts, but is exposed as a coward before murder." It hauls masses of black men through its machinery, but fails to protect them from bodily injury and death. It is at once both oppressive and inadequate. And what I hear you talking to about to is not just the oppression of, of law enforcement as it is, but the inadequacy. And um, I, I don't know how otherwise to tell you that I... Um, that that resonates with me other than to say you know i hear you and i, I hear that voice when we go into um and talk to communities that are um the most at risk of violence Tim. keith thank you for your leadership um thank you for experience i could never understand um because i am a white person living in a society um, that we're in, that is um, white supremacist, capitalist, uh, and patriarchal. But I am committed to healing. I am committed to um, restoration. I am committed to doing my personal work and our work together. And I know that's going to take a community effort with a strategic plan. Um, and I thank you for the work that you've done um, and those that came before to lay the groundwork for this to be possible so that we can reimagine public safety and, um, and policing as we know it. Um, but thank you for offering your guidance and your perspective on the piece. Thank you. Sage, do you have a question for the panel? I do, and uh, it ties to this topic, but it's going to feel a little left field. Um, I'm a finance manager. I, can, I'm, I focus on budgets and numbers and math for a living. So I would like to see us have a conversation around where we think we can fund reparations and initial funding into the fund. So we've got some time while um, we have a collective of people working on what that could look like, how they might use money, how money might be put to work for betterment of the community. Um, I love the idea, by the way, earlier shared by several of uh, participatory budgeting being an option. But I am, I have an idea and I would like to float it with everyone and uh, as a follow-up to it here, if you have your own ideas on how we may jumpstart some initial funding. So there is, uh, we know that we have city-owned land. We know that we have um, some that we gained through the process of urban renewal and that we've pledged as of last night to hold on to that and not make any choices on um, selling it or um, anything until we have more clarity on reparations. But there is a parcel in downtown that has been long a thorn in the side of the community and fought over and fought over for various uses and is what I call the most ready. So when we have a piece of land, there are lots of processes to go through to ready a piece of land for sale or development it can take years. So we have a parcel that's really ready. We know it is a pit of despair. 
this may feel like a little bit of a random question, but we have gone through enormous amounts of public input, and my question is this. Do you think that we should cut ties and sell the pit of possibilities, I would call it, and find and go to RFP to find a private developer who will build to the community's vision and embrace what the community has envisioned there and buy the land from us and cut our ties with ownership with that parcel and put it to rest and use the funds and the proceeds from that sale to jumpstart a reparations fund. Would you support this? And if not, do you have ideas on the initial funding for a reparations fund? Say, who would you like to answer first? Sorry, I, I guess I get to I get okay. to text people. Sorry, um, Rich, go for it. Okay, um, uh, my answer is I. I'm trying to stay out of this process and see what the community generates. And already, I think the conversation has included everything from, you know, yes, land, returning the land that was taken by urban renewal in um, East End Valley Street, for example, um, would be a me meaningful part of reparations to community programs to just cut direct payments. And I'm trying to keep my fingerprints off of that right now. I do think as a budget person myself that um, a reparations package involving land is the most sensible thing, but I haven't given any, um, I haven't given any thoughts to what parcels. And I should say the, the I went to the design um, presentation for um, potential building slash park um, projects on that property, and they're so gorgeous. And just to clarify, I'm not saying that we tell how to spend the money. I'm just saying to have the money jumpstart. Right. Who's next, Sage? Um, let's go, Keith. All right. Um, I'm open to any possibilities to fund um, reparations. Um, that's that's an adequate possibility. I think some other possibilities, which I've thought about in depth um, and asked many questions at behind the scenes, are setting up a permanent fund, which uh, has the principal set in perpetuity and the residual being spent. How do you fund that? The city could make uh, uh, payments to that fund over an extended period of time. There are other ways to fund it. I've come across a what's called a blended component unit, where the city sets up a 501c3, and so you would initially have a fund by the city set up that would fund this 501c3 that the city could structure and how it's ran and get the funds out to the people that need it. Uh, how do you put money in that? Um, we could take money from this whole quote unquote deep, deep divest, invest in the police, put it into that. Uh, we could also utilize a bond project. Um, I was initial proponent and, and one of the architects of helping start bonds for the city back, we could do that. Uh, that's 25 million right there if you choose to put into a reparations project to start off. So there are many ways to do it. Um, the community has to come forth with their ideas, but as an elected official and leader, uh, on that front, it's our it's our job to kind of help come up with some things too. So I have been thinking about it. I have lots of ideas. I see your hand. Up. Does that mean I'm last? All right. Yeah. So, thank you, Ken. In order for us to talk about what community engagement would look like, in order for us to have reparations that are meaningful, we would have to engage the community in a massive, serious way um, and purposefully. And we've already done that with a bit of opportunity. Um, so, what I need for our community to do in order to really get well and in right relationship with each other is to think about not just one thing, but the whole thing. Um, for example, I just adopted some new chickens, and so when I go to get eggs, it's the whole dozen. So let's talk about resource mapping. Not just one lot, because I've heard in city council meetings that we were gonna look at land that we were not already using for reparations, but that excludes the, the Burton Street Community Center, the Shiloh Community Center, um, Stevens Lee Rec Center, um, the ABC store on Charlotte Street. Um, and so when we think about land that we're already using that doesn't belong to the city because it was stolen during urban renewal and redlining, that's one of the things in the resource mapping, but there's many. 
I see the CoThink call for fifteen to twenty million dollar line item budget and the city budget. We're going to have to sift the whole budget to do that. What about the county budget? What about the Tourism Development Authority? What about the Dogwood Health Trust? What about all of the public housing that needs to go into the Community Land Trust? We have a lot of resources and we need accountability for them. Great, thank you. I'm going to ask you to hold on because we do have a poll at the end for those of you in the community who are on the call. But first, Rich, your question to the panel. Okay. Um, I guess my question is for everybody in the panel and it's just a yes or no. Um, if you're elected, will you commit to serve out your whole term living in the city of Asheville, not running for higher office, to do the job that you're elected to do? Okay, who do you want to hear from first? I'll just take them in order. Mm -hmm. I do. I commit to that, Rich. This is my home and my family's home, and there's nothing more I'd rather do. Um, I, my intention is to be a little old lady piano teacher in this town, otherwise I wouldn't be getting in all this good trouble, so I'm in for the long haul. I commit to doing what's best for my family and the people that I serve, uh, whether that be here or wherever else I commit to serving out my term and should anything happen uh, we'll take it as it comes well thank you all i do believe that we have a poll for yes there it is for all of you who are participating please take a moment to participate and while you are doing that um I would like to personally thank not just the candidates, but all of you from the community who have been engaged in this call today. I'd like to thank the team folks who um, participated in organizing this call and a special, special, special thanks to Dewana Little. Um, in case it's not clear, there is so much value in the folks particularly the people of color and the black people specifically who are from this community. So thank you so much, Dewana, for all that you do. Thank you both. Thank all of you. Thanks, Taisha, and everybody who submitted questions. Thank you all. And I would, I would love to talk to all of you and, and just expand on some more questions because I really wanted to see some of um, the answers, <laughs> hear more of your answers and it was some more questions that came from the community. And so I would like to thank again all of the community members that did submit questions. Um, I do apologize that we were not able to get to all the questions, but I hope that you gained um, some general knowledge and understanding of each individual candidate and their stance on the different topics that um were discussed tonight so, so can i uh, sorry i don't mean to interrupt can i ask that any questions that we didn't get to answer that you email out to all of us and we'll maybe try to find a way to put them online on our websites or um or get them out there or just get them back to you i love that great idea rich Great, thank you maybe we can get them uh, get the answers on the website for ymi and building bridges that sounds great great all right, well, thank you, it everyone. is 8.31. Thank you all. Thank you. Y'all have a great rest of y'all week. Recognize y'all greatness, everyone on the call and the candidates. <laughs> hey, one last thing. Remember, this is the last week for taking the Reimagining Police survey that is out. Uh, if you can find it on the city site, but please, everybody, go take that week. The input is crucial. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Just staring contest. I don't know if any of the candidates are going to drop off the call before you guys kick us off. Anybody who's on here, uh, elections November 3rd, this whole ballot matters. <laughs> yeah, so people are casting. That's crazy to think people are casting, returning their ballots already. We already have, um, um, in North Carolina, there's like 1,500 votes in or something already of people who've already and voted. And the council's on the back bottom of the ballot? Yes. 
Vote down your ballot. Mm. So, and if people Shout out to my sister taught me that in IRL. Good points on the, in the yeah. chat today. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 